All right, greetings and welcome to episode number 11 of Crunch Time Plays. And our guest today is one of the awesome women in sports media. And since her favorite sport to cover is college baseball, we're going to call her the ultimate utility player, if you will. And she's Miss Do It All for ESPN. She covers college football, college basketball, and college baseball. She's also the co host of the Sideline Pass podcast, along with Molly McGrath and Allison Williams. And just so excited to have Chris Budden on today. Chris, do you? You have time to sleep with all that you're doing and being a, <laughs> being a wife and the superhero mom that you are. I'll tell you what, the, the mom part gets in the way of the sleep more than the actual work part. When I'm on a road trip and I'm at a hotel, that's like the best night's sleep ever uh, in comparison to being home with two little ones. And, so uh, I manage every now and again. I bet your uh, your husband enjoys whenever you, you, never, you go off because he's the one that gets to wake up in the middle of the night, you know? Exactly. It's funny when I leave, like he's very routine oriented. So when I come back from like an extended road trip, I, I come back and it's like, there's new rules. There's a new schedule. It's like, this is how we're doing things. And I, I've lost all control of the household. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, hopefully everything's going well for you out in Texas. I know you and you guys have been in my thoughts and prayers over the past couple of weeks, just to kind of talk about that and what you guys went through out there. Yeah, we were one of the fortunate ones. Um, our power situation was a rolling outage. So it was on an hour, off an hour, on an hour, off an hour for three straight days. And uh, it was really more of a inconvenience than anything because uh, the, the power stayed on long enough for our house to stay above 60 degrees and we didn't have any pipes burst. So we were one of the, the fortunate ones. There were a lot of others that are still dealing uh, with some of the ramifications and leaks and water inside their house. So we, we, we maintain pretty well. That's awesome to hear. And th so glad that you guys and every couple families I know out in Texas weren't affected very much either. So I'm just so thankful for that. And the whole state will, you know, be in our thoughts and prayers going forward. And so going to some more uh, fun topic here, I saw, <laughs> Uh, Peter Burns tweeted this morning, what is the best jersey in college sports? And I just thought about it. And I was like, I got to ask Chris about this because she covers all college sports. And so she's seen, I don't know how many uniforms. So what, what is the best jersey in college sports, Chris? Yeah, to me is the baby blue baseball uniforms for Ole Miss. They're just like, they're so classic looking. And two years ago, which was the, the last baseball season I covered, they would wear those uh, whenever they had a big game or they were having good luck. And so they would continue to wear them. I know there's like flashy ones at Oregon for football. And then there's like really classic ones with Notre Dame. Uh, but I don't know, something about a baseball uni I love and the powder blue at Ole Miss is just awesome. Hey, I mean, I agree with you. I mean, I know Oregon's uniforms are awesome, but they're, they're just too loud for me sometimes. And I just like a nice classic look. And like you mentioned, the, the baby blues for Ole Miss are really awesome. You know, in football and basketball, along with baseball, I thoroughly enjoy whenever they wear those. My favorite since I'm in South Carolina, probably I've just gotten used to the the Yankee grays that South Carolina wears on the road with the black Carolina on the front is a big staple in the, in the big, you know, NCAA tournament and college world series years in 2010 through 2012. And so I think that, that one's probably the best one for me, but I'm, I'm a big fan of the Ole Miss baby blues as well. I don't know if this will upset you being a, a, a South Carolina fan, but uh, an underrated uni is the Argyle on the North Carolina jerseys. Yeah, I, I do like that. I, I, <laughs> I, I have to admit that that does look good. All right, going to college baseball, Chris, I know you're excited to get it back. I know it's your favorite thing to, to cover. And just talk about the, I know you had a big run and, in 2019 with Vanderbilt and the college world series and you covered them throughout the postseason, and then the tragic situation with Donnie Everett just talk about how you know thankful we are that college baseball is back and kind of talk about what you saw from Vanderbilt during that run yeah it was like magical that's the only word that I could come up with it and I you didn't really realize that tour until the end uh, we had covered that team and they were fantastic all season and going into the SEC tournament, 
they had 101 on the back fence because that was what Donnie Everett hit pitch wise miles per hour uh, the last time he played there. And that was going to be the last time they left that up because Donnie would have been a senior. For those who don't know the story, when Donnie was a freshman playing for Vanderbilt, uh, he passed away. He drowned the weekend before their regional baseball tournament. Um, Donnie Everett would have been a senior on that team. Honestly, probably wouldn't have even been on the team because he probably would have been drafted after his junior year. He was that good. Um, but you began to see in Hoover at the SEC tournament what that meant to that team in that senior class. Because in my interview with Tim Corbin after they won the SEC championship, he got emotional and started crying. And so you started to feel the weight of that. So then we go to Omaha and they invited Donnie's parents with them for the entire trip. And they would sit next to Maggie Corbin, which is Tim's wife. And just, you felt it everywhere because we were staying in the same hotel as Vanderbilt. And so watching them walk through and watching them during the championship celebrate on the field and be on the stadium with the rest of the senior class. And Donnie was their only child. So I don't like that. That was also probably the first real moment like that, that I was witnessing as a mom. I had just had also my, my second child, my daughter, um, three months before that. And so watching that entire thing unfold was like, I, I, I can feel it like it was yesterday. Yeah. No, I just, just watching, you know, just as a bystander that year, just, just watching, uh, you know, just that team. And it seems to me, and I wanted to get your opinion on this and part of the reason why, you know, people love college baseball so much is there's not, especially for you as a being around the action as much as you are, it seems like you have an opportunity to get a lot more personal, you know, with the coaches and players, given that there's not as many players on the team. So you're able to get, you know, kind of a, a deeper dive into those players kind of lives and stuff like that. I, I, I also, it might have to do with the players on the team, but it's also just the nature of baseball. Like before a football game, before a basketball game, like, those athletes are so in the routine of music and stretching, warming up, going through the plays. Like you can't disturb them during that time. Same thing with a coach. Like he doesn't want to talk to you. Like Nick Saban, like will do his routine. He'll walk to the end of the field. He'll come back. You get two questions. And that is, it is so routine oriented with baseball. I think it's because of the number of games, you know, like major league baseball, I got 162. Like you can't be that intense every single day because of the nature of the sport. And so, you know, you're sitting there in, an hour before first pitch and you're just sitting in the dugout talking to whoever. And they're just like, they don't care. Like if I was talking to the third base coach or the pitching coach, it's just, it's very relaxed. And the players are, yeah, the most intense parts of the game, like players are doing rally caps and putting bananas on their heads. They're not, you know, it's just, it's a different sport all around, which allows you to connect with people unlike any other sport that I've covered. Yeah, I agree. And it's really fun for me, just how calm and having fun those players are in the most intense moments of the game. I mean, I've seen, you know, I don't know how many rally caps and mm -hmm. find, find having you know from animals in the dugout to, to ju <laughs> I mean, it just how how fun is it for you just to kind of be on the road and just getting to know so many of these teams and, and coaches and players yeah it's a blast um especially like when you look at Omaha we're there for 16 days and we have a meeting every morning with the coaches and it's so much more laid back. Like we're having breakfast with them in our, you know, workout clothes. Like they're in the gyms with you because there's only so many hotels in Omaha. You're walking through the fanfare. They're all there with their families too, uh, which I think makes a difference in, in a lot of the other sports when you're on the road with teams, like you have no access to them especially in football, um, because they're only there for 24 hours. 
Uh, so that's what makes just baseball in general so unique because you can be at the hotel lobby breakfast and sit down with a coach and have some bacon and a coffee and get to know his wife. That's another thing. Like I've gotten to know players' wives and, and coaches' wives and their kids just because of the nature of being around them all through those long extended, you know, tournaments. Yeah. And how, what, what makes the kind of difference in kind of the way you prepare for a, like a, a football game or basketball game or baseball? How, is there any similarities and differences into how do you prepare for those kind of games or is each sport kind of different in the way you prepare? Uh, each sport's different. I would say that the, the basis of knowledge is the same of needing to know everyone's background that you cover. I feel like it's important to my in my job to know everyone's medical and injury background too, because let's say a kid tears his ACL and I didn't know that he tore his ACL the year before, then you kind of miss half the story. So the, the basis of the background of the players is the same, but the role is so different from football and basketball than it is for baseball. Because when you walk into a football game, you might have all these stories in case of a blowout and 95% of it hits the cutting room floor because so much of what you're reporting on is the eyes and ears that no one else has access to, that the guys in the booth don't have access to. There's not as much eyes and ears in a baseball game. There's not injuries. There's not a whole lot of coaches yelling at their players. So because you lack that, how do I add to the broadcast in different ways? And it's being able to sit in a dugout 30 minutes before the game and have conversations with people that not everyone else was privy to. So in that sense, I have to come in with a lot more material to be able to add to the broadcast because it's just the nature of the sport isn't the same as football and basketball when I can lean in and hear a huddle. Now, sometimes in baseball, depending on where your position is, you get lucky and you can hear conversations, but they're also just, they're not as intense like they are in a football or basketball game. I know you, I know you prepare a great deal for these games and you probably have, you know, five or six pages, you know, of notes that you have and a lot of it in a lot of the broadcasts is how the game is flowing. Just whenever it's like a, a really close game or even if it's a blowout, kind of do you tend to just go with what the guys in the booth are talking about or you kind of just rely on what you've prepared for? Uh, you, you go with the flow of the game. I mean, if I had a great story on, um, you know, a, I'm trying to think like a like a relief pitcher and he's not in the game, like I can't – take a hard left turn if the guy is not in the game or isn't playing well. Um, so a lot of it is having stuff that I would call like add-ons where the guys in the booth are already talking on a certain particular topic or conversation. And I can hit my producer and say, I can add to that. Or, um, you know, they're talking about a way a certain player has played and I see him on the sidelines, like, fidgeting with his wrist because it hurts like those kind of things are what I consider add-ons um, sometimes they're just reports of you know there's a medical injury and sometimes really good stories about a player and his background or his family or kind of more the feature stories require a little bit more production so you have you know we talk about it during a commercial break but for the most part like in a close game, I really try, I don't hit my producer up at all because you want the game to breathe. And in a blowout, that's when kind of you use all your material because there's, you don't have to do play by play of every play then. Then you can have more broader conversations. How different has it been um, just from years past go leading into this year during COVID? How different uh, is broadcasting as far as that? I know you're, now you're interacting with the coaches and players you know, via Zoom and you used to, you know, get them in person and different things like that. What kind of things do you miss out on going from Zoom? What kind of things do you miss out on out on Zoom that you would normally get uh, during a personal meeting with a coach or player? I actually think Zoom in that aspect has helped in some ways more than others because in person for football we only usually get the home team 
in the away team, we would have to do on a conference call. And coaches are very leery to give up a whole lot of information over a call that you can't tell who's on the line. So I feel that those meetings where they can see everybody, it has built a little bit better relationship and allows you to have more personal conversations. So I don't feel like with the Zoom aspect, we've lost too much of that. What we have lost a great deal is um, the post-game interviews, the emotion of those, because in football, we were not allowed on the field. So I couldn't run up to a coach right after he won and interview him in that moment. I had to wait probably 15 minutes by the time they got off the field and they came to our mic stand and we had to be six feet apart. Those are the things that I think made a huge difference this year in coverage. And a lot of times like after a game where I could have gotten a quick interview, well, we got to go to the next game. So they can't wait around 15 minutes for me to finally get a coach to walk over to me. So that's what I really lost during COVID this past year. See, I, I know whenever you were covering the, the Iowa State game when Matt Campbell mm-hmm. just got so emotional at the end of the at the end of the game there, I know it, it would have been you kind of missed out on getting the opportunity to kind of run up to him and catch him in that moment. Cause I feel like you get a lot, I don't know if you feel like this, but I know I would get a lot better um kind of a feel out of a coach if I could, you know, run out there and catch him like right time the game was over. And like you said, now you kind of have to wait around for him a little bit. What kind of differences do you think? And maybe the emotions are the same for a coach, but is there any difference between running up right after the game and having so he can have time to and having to wait so he has time to process everything? Yeah, I just think that you take a lot of the emotion out of it when you have to wait 15 minutes, Um, especially like a game like that was the Texas Iowa State game like that was on a missed field goal like that. That was the end of the game. And so he still got emotional. It was a fantastic interview, but there were, you know, a lot others where when you wait, it allows them to decompress like 15 minutes is a long time when you're thinking about like being able to calm your emotions down. And so, and then the other thing is like, you're usually midfield and players are jumping on the coach and high-fiving them in the middle of the interview, like all that's gone as well. Yeah. And that's one of the things that makes it fun for me is just watching the guys like, you know, like you said, the, just the immediate emotion after, after the game. And I can tell, we definitely lost a lot of that. And one of how often do you get to collaborate with your peers? I know you you've got a lot of great people that work there at ESPN. And do you how many times do y'all talk, you know, throughout the year? And I know you've started the podcast with Molly McGrath and Allison Williams. Just kind of talk about that and how great of a chance it is to get to collaborate with such great people that you have. Yeah, well, week in and week out when you're with your football crew, like that becomes, or your basketball crew, that becomes your team. So that's kind of who you collaborate with. But in terms of other sideline reporters at ESPN, like people don't realize, like I see them in person once a year at a conference uh, that or a seminar that we do because every other weekend we're all at different games. We're not covering the same thing. So we don't really get to see each other. And COVID allowed an opportunity for Molly McGrath and Allison Williams and I to start this podcast. And honestly, like, they're so brilliant. And I have learned so much from them. And we started the podcast because it was just kind of a a love project that we wanted to do because we get asked a lot of time for advice and we don't always have the time to be able to give everybody. So we thought we put it in one place. And honestly, like I've learned probably more from them and talking to them week in and week out about we get so deep in the woods and like nerdy about it, but like every question that you asked and would you have worded it this way and this way? And we get really nitty gritty because we really nerd out over some of this stuff. But Um, I, I just, I've learned so much about their headspace in certain moments and knowing that, well, if I, you know, 
sometimes you leave a game and you overanalyze everything that you've done. And then you realize, you know what, we're all the same. And we all sit there and overanalyze things. And also how different it is watching the game on a TV. Uh, Cause like there were times where either a bowl game or our games got canceled, like Molly and I would be watching the game on TV, watching Allison and wondering like, is she doing this or, or what about this question? And it's so different just watching it through a screen and on Twitter than when you're at the game, like the types of questions, you don't know what's like trending on social media or what the cameras have caught that you didn't see. So it was an interesting aspect um, of that as well. But honestly, like that has been like the biggest blessing out of this COVID time was building that relationship and the friendships with Molly and Allison and we text every day and Molly's a new mom. So Allison and I have um, loved seeing her kind of new journey with that as well. Yeah, you mentioned uh, bringing up a great point that I wanted to touch on with you next is being a mom, you know, and working in the capacity that you guys do. Just kind of what's changed as far as uh, that. And um, just, I know for me, it's, I really admire watching you guys because you've, your moms, you're, you know, you got so many family responsibilities and yet you're still have the job that you love. Just kind of talk about that and how that's kind of affected uh, your life. Yeah. I mean, it's a, the, the challenge of having to multitask and schedule. And, you know, I, I used to give everything to my job. I'm not saying I don't anymore, but like I could drop anything if I was at the grocery store and go run out to breaking news. Like, can't do that anymore to make sure someone is at home watching the kids uh, and, and managing their schedules and my schedules, which is probably the hardest part of it. Um, honestly, like the, the, a lot of the work that I do at home, I can do around um, their schedules. So that is pretty easy. The stuff that I do during the week, it's hard though. You know, like my husband used to travel for his job when he was in tennis and he would travel and I would travel and it would require like me drop it to flying with my son, Jace, when I first had him and dropping him off at the TSA in DFW and handing him on to my parents. So then I could go to the next game. You learn, um, how to manage it better that we couldn't continue doing what we were doing in terms of like both of our travel schedules that there you just have to simplify some things i also learned to, how to get rid of mom guilt you know like you feel guilty that you're not able to do all the other things as your work peers and then you feel guilty that you can't be at every baseball or karate or whatever event with your kids and if you sit there and try and be perfect at both of them and give a hundred percent at both of them, you will constantly fail in your head because you feel like you're not giving enough. And I, don't, I live by the phrase, be where your feet are. So when I'm at home with my kids and I'm not working, I try and be with them. When I'm at work, my job gets, you know, 98% of me. But again, like it's all what your own expectations are. Like, I don't really have very high expectations of myself <laughs> in terms of like trying to be perfect all the time. Like I just kind of got rid of that. And so what is, you know, someone who does it all or manages it all, it's all based on what your own expectations are. And so for me, like if my house is a mess, but my kids are happy and they made it to karate on time and they made it to school and they did their homework and everyone got fed and I did a good job on air, then that, then it was a good day. <laughs> That's awesome. Who are some of the people that, that you look up to? I know um, when I was preparing for the show, I listened to, you know, some of the interviews that you've done over the past little while. And you mentioned, you know, Tom Rinaldi, who used to be at ESPN, is now at Fox Sports now. Just kind of what, it, what kind of impact did he have on your career? And who are some of the other mentors and different things that you've had? Yeah, you know what's funny? Um, Tom Rinaldi, I have always loved as a storyteller and an interviewer. And I, I don't even have like a close relationship with him. It's not like him and I have sat down and um, talked about, I, we have a relationship, but it's not like, you know, I, I call him every time I need to ask a big interview. Uh, but I love his approach to storytelling. I love like he is the goat of interviewers. And I, I always go back to a podcast he did with Richard Deitch 
and he had to go interview Nick Saban after they lost in the national championship game. And he was talking about how he didn't know what to ask. Like I had to think about the smartest, best question because otherwise Saban, you get a little worked up over Saban because you don't want him to think you're dumb. And he goes, I realized the easiest question uh, or the best question was the easiest question. And that's what went wrong. Uh, which shows you like, Rinaldi didn't give me that advice. He just did it on a podcast. And I have taken that advice to everything. So, you know, for people that are wondering, like, how do I get advice? Like, listen to podcasts. That's how I got the best advice I ever did. Um, the, the person who really helped me hands on at the beginning of my career in national sports was Pam Oliver. I shared, we, I was, we were both working for Fox and it was my first year with them. And we were going to a seminar and I shared an Uber with her to our seminar place. She didn't know who I was from anyone. And she probably thought I was like the most annoying, like 29 year old, uh, like asking her a million questions. And she could not have been nicer and sat there and answered every question. And I talked to her through the entire season. So there's things that you don't realize when you move into regional and national sports and, and doing live events of the art of selling your stuff, selling your stories to a producer and your, and your team, um, being okay with a lot of your info, not making the broadcast. So those were a lot of things that she helped me get through my first season. I wanted to ask you about that. You mentioned, you know, I, I know we talked about it earlier, you've got it, so many pages of notes and going into a game and how, how difficult is it? Or maybe you just put it out of your mind now, but when you work so hard to kind of prepare for the game and a lot of that stuff just doesn't make it on the air. Is that, was that deflating for you when you first started and, but is it not really deflating so much anymore? Yeah, because I think my first couple of years, I took it personally. Um, and, and maybe I also don't, at that point, I didn't have the eye like a producer watches and does a game. Um, so I had to learn that the game dictates the producer, the director, the, the booth doesn't dictate what gets on air. It's really the game. And if a lot of my stuff didn't make it in, but I still had a ton of hits, like I'm great with that because it's material that I came up with in the game. And when this year, especially when there weren't fans and we could hear so much more, it allowed me the opportunity to take those notes and put them to the side and really focus on what I was hearing and seeing. Sometimes we have a, all these like stories, oh, I gotta get this and I gotta get this and it is now the time to sell it because I saw that like you, that becomes so much of your focus that you're, it takes away of what you're watching and seeing. And I realized when I was allowed to like let that, you know, go to the wayside that I was allowing my brain more space to focus on small things like that no one would have even noticed like of, of a quarterback you know Spencer Rattler was he, he took a hit and I watched him come off and he slightly put his hand on like his midsection and I watched him and he seemed fine and he went out to play another series and he couldn't get through the series and the the guys in the booth are like, oh, he must have gotten hurt on that play. And I was like, you know what? I was so laser focused on watching him come off the field two series ago that I knew exactly what play it was. And I knew exactly how he reacted. Sometimes if you're just watching the game and so focused on how do I get a story in, you'll miss those small little things that make a huge difference in the game. Yeah, that's an awesome point. I never, never thought about really that. I, I know a lot of times for me, whenever I go to games, I'm just focused on the game. I'm not really focused on what happens on the sideline. And I feel like we miss a lot of that. And one of the things that I feel like you miss kind of being at the game instead of watching it on TV is you don't, you don't really get the, the guys and gals like you telling us, you know, hey, he just came off the field two plays ago and he was holding his chest on the bench just – and. How much do you take from what the whenever there are fans in the stands, do you kind of leave a little bit of room for your notes or whatever to kind of gauge what people that you hear conversations that are being had before the game starts, what people are talking about? Do you 
Do you take any notes on that at all? Uh, I do on the sidelines of notes between players and coaches, um, not necessarily in the stands because there's not a ton of interaction then. Um, but I do, I mean, to just, I mean, it could be small things. Did someone not come out for, uh, you know, for the final five minutes of warmups? Or I remember I, I did a game at SMU this year and the entire away team came out to warm up two and a half hours before the game like before I even got there. Well, that's a report. It's things that like just anything out of the ordinary. If something, a producer of ours, Bart Fox, who uh, used to work at ESPN, always said, if, it may, it's, if it's something that makes you go, huh, it's worth looking into and it's worth reporting on. How far have we, we're going back to our conversation earlier about, you know, being moms and different things like that and working in sports, how, how far have we come with, with women in sports? I know that's been, been kind of a contentious topic here over the last few years. How, how far do you think we've come and what more opportunities for growth are there? I mean, there's always gonna be an opportunity for growth until you're able to look at a broadcast and see more than one female. I mean, it is like, you know, here's the, Here's the two men in the booth and here's the female sideline reporter because that's all we think a female can do. Uh, we are seeing more and more female play by play, but every, t I don't know, there's, I, I, I see it both ways. Cause sometimes I think, oh, we've come so far, you know, like I'm about to be 37 and on TV and I still feel like I have a long way to go at ESPN. I don't know if I would have thought that 10 years ago the amount of women at ESPN and older women at ESPN and not just a bunch of 20 year olds. But then stories come out about the Mets or whatever. And I'm like, every time I feel like we've taken two steps forward, we take a step back. And I have plenty of those stories. And will I share them? I, I don't know. Um, I haven't yet. I think about it. And, you know, some of the one of the main reasons I haven't is my family. You know, is it worth it for me to tell it? Um, will things change? Probably not. For my dad to hear all about the stuff that happened to me or my husband, you know, my husband knows, but like my, my parents don't. So that until we're all at a place where we can all feel comfortable sharing the things that have happened to us. It's going to continue because people know that they can get away with it. Where the biggest difference has come is in our male colleagues sticking up for us and saying, that's not okay. Or if we're in an interview and a coach treats me poorly in front of them, of them saying, that's not right, coach, or that was an asinine comment, or, you know, I've had plenty of times where my male colleagues have stuck up for me um, and probably many more that haven't because they knew I would stick up for myself too. And I've learned to do that a little bit more as you get older, but when you're younger and you're 27 and you have your first national job, like how is that person supposed to go put their career on the line to share what so-and-so did to them? You know, 10 years later, I'm at a point now where I feel like I've solidified myself in my career, what I, I'd be more comfortable sticking up for myself. But those also aren't always the women that are being preyed upon. It's the people that they know that they can take advantage of because they're not that point in their career. Yeah. I mean, you mentioned you've got a, you think you've got a long ways to go and are, are there any other uh, things that you'd like to do, whether it be at ESPN or games that you like to call, or, or I know you're a big tennis person as well as I know you've been talking about calling that some, how, are there any further you know, career goals that you have? You know, I'm, I'm where I want to be. I love ESPN. I love their commitment to storytelling. I'd love to just do bigger games. I love to call a national championship football game. I would love to, be on major tennis and call Wimbledon and the US Open. Um, so I, I have the role that I want to do. I would just like to do bigger, better games throughout my career. Yeah, and one of the things that I thought um, was cool and I know y'all were, were cheering for was when, you know, Tom Rinaldi left and, and Allison got to call the, or the national championship game with, 
with Maria and, and Chris and Kirk. Just kind of, how did, did you guys, you know, encourage her in that moment? And was it, how did you feel about her calling that game? Was it kind of deflating for you or was it, you just, no, happy, not at you all. Just, just happy for her? Yeah. And I, I wish that that's what people saw out of women in sports. You know, the, it used to be because there are so few jobs that like people thought we all hated each other because we all wanted uh, those jobs from each other. Um, but what it's turned out to be is, yeah, I mean, I would have loved to call that game on. And so would have Molly. Molly was at home pregnant and she might have if she wasn't. So but just to, to have the camaraderie to sit back and cheer for someone like, you know, your time is going to come. Um, she didn't get that job over me like that. I'm not sitting there being like, that should have been me. Like she's worked her tail off. She's done it longer than me. She's better than me. Like it's, it's having the humility to understand that and also be able to say like she kicked butt and I want her to do a jo great job. If you are what you put out into the world will come back to you. So if I sat there and I wanted her to screw up so that she didn't get it next time, like that comes back to you in a lot of ways. And being a good person in this business goes so far. And the people that will cheer you on um, will, will be there when you need it the most. That's an awesome point because one of the things that I think we've lost as a society is, you know, we're, we're, we're too focused on other people failing. Mm -hmm. And we, we don't, you know, take the time to encourage each other and, and uplift each other. And I think that's really awesome that you guys did that. Thank you. And that's, it's been, um, again, like the friendship between the three of us has been really cool to see develop and to, you know, to look at your phone after you do a first hit, even two years ago when I did, um, Omaha, cause that was the first national championship I'd ever covered. And, the amount of people, like when I got to the dugout after my opening hit and had just from all, all my colleagues, because they know what it means to get that kind of support because you're so nervous or whatever. Um, there Even there's a clip of like Aaron Andrews and Carissa Thompson who are really close after her first hit in the Super Bowl. Like there's video of someone um, shooting them and Carissa comes and gives her a big hug because she knew how stressful that moment was. And just to have someone that, you know, gives you a pat on the back in that moment. Yeah, I agree. I mean, it's it's just awesome to see people encouraging each other, and and I I like to do the I like to do the same thing, and just can't thank you enough for coming on today, Chris. I know you're about to be really busy here with college basketball conference tournaments and college baseball ramping up here, and tell everybody where they can find you on social media and what games you got coming up. Yeah, uh, at Chris Button on Twitter and on Instagram. And hopefully we will figure out, it's been hard with uh, basketball being an indoor sport and the protocols of where we can and cannot be during the game. So hopefully we'll be doing some conference championship games here coming up is the hope. Well, Chris, you're one of the best and all the best to you and your family. And got to get you back on here uh, if you're willing to, talk about some more college baseball here in the future, but all the best to you. And we'll look forward to catching up with you later on. Awesome, Bennett. Thank you so much. Thank you, Chris.